So when I travel abroad, I hear people say all the time that they have heard there is a big problem in Europe. You see, they don't know the details as well as I do, but um, they are all convinced that there is a crisis in Europe and that uh, Europe is going downhill and perhaps is committing suicide. Okay, I'll go into that question, but not without first affirming that on the whole everything in the world is getting better as the Beatles song used to go it's getting better all the time so it is getting better it, like uh, the philosopher Stephen Pinker has argued we are now more secure than we used to be we are richer we are healthier we live longer and so on so in practically every respect you can think of, the world is getting a better place. Take, for example, the environment. Uh, I was recently in Beijing, in China, and I still used to have these uh, images of people uh, with handkerchiefs in front of their face uh, to protect against the pollution. Well. Beijing has become a lot cleaner and healthier, visibly. Now, the same thing is in Delhi, except that there the effect of this positive environmentalist policy of cleaning up, you see, of, of preventing causes of pollution, that has less effect because the population is incredibly uh, growing and the possession of cars per family is growing and so on. Uh, so there the problem is harder to, to attack. But still, you see, in India too, you see enormous achievements in environmental terms. In places like uh, the IIT campus in Gandhinagar, which is only a few years old, uh, there is an enormous, uh, well, there is a very modern ecological arrangement the place is, uh, is autarkic, that is to say it's not dependent on sources from outside, it, it cleans itself. The same thing with the place where I've just been, the uh, C.P. Ramaswamy IR campus in uh, Chennai. Um, so, you know, they have their own water supply, they have their own cleaning arrangements and so on. Hardly anything enters the campus or leaves the campus. So it's, a, it's very modern, it's, it's really a model for the future. Um, I'll say another example that at first sight is problematic, but in fact shows, shows a very positive evolution. You see, in the West, when you argue about uh, the guilt for uh, global pollution, then you see some leftists say, oh yeah, it's all because of the West. And then others say, well, look at the 10 rivers uh, that bring the most plastic into the ocean. They are all in Asia, like the Ganga, like the Indus, like the, uh, the Yangtze, the Yellow River, and so on. They are very polluted. Yeah, true. But why is that? You see, when I was a child, the rivers in Europe were very polluted. And there was no life in them. In fact, I remember a slogan of the Green Party in its early years that they wanted to have fish in our local river, the, the Schelde. And uh, there were no fish at the time. Now, of course, it's back. It, it, there's life again. And so uh, I would say that the enormous pollution during the Industrial Revolution was some kind of puberty phenomenon. You see, initially, Okay, there was uh, new discoveries, new possibilities, but there was a price to be paid. So initially there was very high pollution, but as people became more conscious, they started remedying that. And so now in the West, mostly pollution is under control. Asia then followed suit, had its own industrial revolution. And so initially there was a high pollution and you still see some traces of that 
like this high plastic consumption. But again, here in India, I see that mostly plastic bags have been replaced by uh, something biodegradable. And so it's only a matter of time before this, this problem of plastic in the environment is solved. And so you see, this is just a, a, general, a general development. The uh, environmental problem is getting under control and the environment is getting greener and so on. You hear in Africa about these uh, so-called green walls that keep out desertification and that in the Sahel have created forests and, and green areas where there used to be a desert. So uh, now uh, enough of the environment, let's talk about the economy. Uh, we see that Asian countries, African countries also, this is insufficiently realized, uh, have a very high economic growth. Like India at the moment under Modi has uh, really uh, developed its potential. Under the Congress government there was a return to socialism, a return to corruption, and therefore a depressing effect on the economy. Now, of course, it is all shining again. Yeah, India is doing very well. Now, that highlights the fact that Europe is not doing so well. You see, in, in Europe, they have a growth rate of maybe 1%, whereas in India, it is like 8% or so. In, in many Asian countries, it is it's very high, it's even double digit. Uh, so Europe is stagnating. That is, that is obvious, you know, that any outsider also could know. Uh, a sign of that, that affects the life of ordinary people. In um, Holland, the care sector is being reformed. You see care of, of old people, of sick people and so on. And rather than the state providing for everything, they are again outsourcing many tasks to the families, to, to private individuals who have to look after the people who need care. So that's a step back from the welfare state. And it's a, a very costly one in the sense that very many people are affected or are going to be affected. It's not at all a small matter. And um, as myself, a consumer of the social security system in my own country, Belgium, I can testify that, you see, uh, people, ordinary people, uh, have to uh, suffer consequences. Like, for instance, medicine that was paid for by the state is no longer paid for by the state, or certain types of therapies and so on. The state is becoming more niggardly, or that's how we feel it. And uh, there's no question of passing any moral judgment about that or what, but uh, th there is a necessity to save money. Why? Because the money is going elsewhere. Now, where is the money going? Here, I'm not going to say anything, but I inquired uh, from a number of important people, top administrators and top bankers, you see, and they know something about the flow of money. And so they say very candidly what in our media is not allowed to be said, namely, this is because of immigration. You see, the immigration figures are very high and they cost the welfare state enormously. So, um, and the cost is more than financial. For example, there is a strong decline in the quality of education. You can see for Belgium, for example, was um, in the international rankings, one of the top countries and it's sliding away. And now the top countries are Asian, are Korea, Japan, and so on. 
Finland is still in the top, but most European countries are sliding backwards. That also has to do with the presence of immigrants in the sense that schools try to provide uh, facilities for them that they uh, don't really have to learn the local language, that they don't have to function in the local language, that much is uh, uh, facilitated for their own languages, their own cultures. And so the uh, basic uh, necessity of a certain homogeneity so that you can focus on the contents of education rather than all such practical matters like language. Um, that is a consequence. And um, that is the factor uh, for an immigration. But as I will argue here, there is of course also a factor that has not, nothing to do with immigration that is internal and that in fact uh, facilitates and heightens uh, the, uh, and, and confirms the problems caused by immigration. I will come to that. Now immigration really is of two types. One is just immigration, people coming. And so there is no selection on what people come. In real immigration countries like Australia, they uh, take care that they don't let in just anyone. They only let in people who are highly qualified and who have already the financial means to support themselves or to save themselves if, if anything happens to them. You see, in Europe, it is just uh, the opposite. Very many uh, people who come go on welfare. Often they don't bother to learn the language and so this handicaps them on the labor market and they don't get very far. They remain dependent. Um, there is a second problem with immigration, but that is a very specific problem. That is the problem of Islam. You see, if you have uh, Africans coming in or uh, uh, there, have been, uh, there has been a Latin American immigration for a while, um, then there is all these so-called refugees, so-called asylum seekers from Syria, Afghanistan. Um, but you see, when they are non-Muslims, they pose a problem in the sense that you have to provide for their integration, for their assimilation, making it possible. And that requires a certain investment. That I am not against. I think migration is a fairly normal phenomenon in history. It should, however, be controlled. The numbers should be reasonable. And of course, every country is uh, sovereign and decides itself whom it lets in. Uh, so that is a problem that, that can be handled. You see, I wouldn't uh, be too worried about that. But then there is a specific problem, which is Islam. There is a lot of Islamic immigration, which comes on top of already the demographic growth of the Muslim population inside the European countries. So what you get is a cumulative effect and so a very high uh, growth rate of the Muslim population. Now what is problematic about that? The fact that Islam has a project of conquest. And you know, I know that now of course uh, all the uh, social media platforms and all the media and, and, and the politicians and so on are going to, you know, be up in arms and be very shrill and sh shriek and howl about Islamophobia and so on. Well, you see, I have the data, they do not. And um, so I know this for fact that Islam has a, pro a program of conquest. This is also affirmed by very many Islamic leaders and it ultimately goes back to the program of conquest, very candidly affirmed by Muhammad. In the Quran, it is said repeatedly that the goal is to have every human being as a Muslim, that everybody should accept Allah and everybody should accept Muhammad's claim to be the prophet. 
Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all going to be violent and commit terrorist attacks, though there is a certain uh, overlap. Like you have very many peaceful Muslims who would never uh, commit terrorism, but who nevertheless support terrorists when they find them in their midst. For example, in Brussels, you had the group of uh, Muslim terrorists who organized and committed the terror acts both in Paris and in Brussels itself. Now, the mastermind was being looked for by the police and they couldn't find him initially until it turned out that he was living, not even hiding, that he was living in a Brussels neighborhood where most people around, being Muslims, were very well aware of his presence, and none of them reported it to the police. So the, the general Muslim population is not entirely innocent. But OK, uh, most of them are not at all inclined to terrorism. Uh, but, but very many so-called moderates do subscribe to the ultimate project of Islam, which is conquest. Uh, only they understand that uh, people who take to violence are a bit romantic and a bit anachronistic. Maybe in the days of the Prophet, you see, raids and, and violence was necessary or was useful. Nowadays, you see, with democracy, which puts a premium on numbers, this is outdated. You see, all you have to do in the, the context of Europe or similarly in the context of India, is to become numerous enough to become the majority and then power just falls into your lap. You see, why wake sleeping dogs by making yourself suspected, uh, by uh, giving the impression of being dangerous through these terrorist acts? You know, why not simply grow and grow and grow and take over? So, many Europeans are worried about that. And so, you have two problems. The problem of immigration in general, and you have the specific problem of Islam. Now, um, these uh, problems are strongly identified with immigrants, with foreigners. But it is very important to understand that they have their root in internal European developments. Very much so. Um, regarding the phenomenon of immigration, uh, you have a Western attitude, first of all, of extreme moralism. It is enough that some paper shows uh, some suffering in some part of the world, and immediately uh, some do-gooders or some leftist activists stand up and say, oh yeah, we have to take them in. You see, they have no other solution except to come to Europe. Well, no. You see, uh, Japan doesn't let asylum seekers in according to their own whim. No, it's the Japanese themselves who decide who comes in, and they don't take asylum seekers. So, you know, it is perfect. And, and this all while Japan has a strongly declining population. The population in, in, of Japan is going down even faster than that of Europe. And nevertheless, they decide that they want to keep Japan Japanese. So, you see, in Europe that is difficult because there are always these extreme moralists. Um, they are, in a way, very provincial because they think world problems can only be solved by Europe. You know, if, if there is a refugee problem in Syria, and in recent years there has been, well, why don't the Arab countries take them in? You see, they have to just walk or take the train from Damascus through Jordania to Saudi Arabia, and there they have plenty of room, and it's a rich country, 
and it can use uh, guest labor and they don't have any problem of adaptation they speak the same language they have the same religion so they can feel at home right away many of the problems that you have in europe just don't present themselves over there so you see if you care about those people you will send them to saudi arabia or to the gulf states now those countries of course themselves say that they don't want refugees not even muslims um, but so yeah you know europeans don't look at the outside world <clears throat> part of the problem is of course hubris it's a very high idea of themselves they think that they are as the norwegians used to call it uh, a human rights superpower that somehow the rest of the world doesn't have these high moral standards that only Europe doesn't, that therefore Europe has to solve those problems. Yeah. Then there is a, a lack of viveka, of the power of discrimination. Very many uh, so-called refugees are not refugees at all. And I know, you see, for a while I've been in this uh, business of caring for refugees, translation, and um, so I know that when I met those people in town, because usually they were on the street, you see, they didn't have a place in society, so they were a lot uh, present in public. So when I met them there, they had a very different story to tell than when they were in, a official, uh, in an official context where they had to tell their story to the uh, refugee authorities. Um, like, uh, and often they had a good laugh at, at the stories that the uh, authorities were willing to believe and that they themselves knew were just ridiculous. Now, um, very often then after being accepted as refugees, it turns out that they do not behave like refugees at all. You see, refugees who really flee a terrible situation, they are grateful. They want to do something back to the country that, that, that welcomed them. These people do the opposite. And that's why you have the term refugees. There's a big rape problem in Europe, thanks to these uh, asylum seekers. In general, the, the problems that exist have been caused or badly worsened by our own elites. And perhaps also by the population in general. You know, you have to not always just blame the elites. The elites only come from the people ultimately. Uh, for example, the um, both the problem of guest, well, problem, the phenomenon of guest workers in the 60s, as well as the problem of outsourcing of our own companies in the 90s and more recently, um, stem from the fact that after all, everybody wants to buy cheaply. So they want to have it as cheap as possible uh, production. And so, what are, what are guest workers good for? Well, for the employers, the good thing is that they can keep wages down. You see, native workers are more demanding. And so the, that's originally why they brought in guest workers, to keep wages down. And the guest workers were very much welcomed. Uh, they were, in the case of the Turks in, in our coal mines, for example, they were given all kinds of religious facilities which usually they didn't avail of. They were not interested. In those days they thought, you see, by walking away from a Muslim country into a pagan country, I leave Islam. And they kept Islam as some kind of private heritage, but they made no song about it. And, uh, and, and, and meanwhile, the, the natives who received them, who welcomed them, also were perfectly willing to 
give them certain facilities, but again, we're also not overly worried about it. This was all uh, arranged at a human level. Um, okay, but then you got the, um, the, the, the new policy in the 70s of what was called family reunification, which meant that not only workers came over and were then going back, no, you see, they brought over their families and they really settled. And so that is when the immigrant problem really began. Um, and that's when the Islamic problem began. And initially, Europeans thought, oh, but religion is on its way out, which at that time was the case in Europe with Christianity. You see, the religious fervor was strongly and fast declining. And so they thought the same thing would happen with Islam. And initially it looked like that. When you look at uh, pictures from, you know, the first generation of Muslim families in, in, in Belgium, for example, there were no veils. You see, this wearing hijab is a, is a recent development. Now, if you go on the tramway in Antwerp, most women wear hijab. But uh, that was not the case then. And so the, um, the Islamic problem has greatly increased. The um, assertiveness of the Muslim community has multiplied. That is to a large extent uh, due to the uh, educational facilities that have been given to the Muslim community. When the first nominal Muslims came, they had little to do with Islam. They followed a few rituals and otherwise they knew nothing about it. They had an idealized image of the Prophet. They knew nothing about it. They hadn't read the Quran, even if they were Arabic speaking. Um, and uh, nowadays, by contrast, they have all gone to uh, Islamic schooling, you know, either a full madrasa or, you know, some form of Islamic Sunday school. And so they have all been indoctrinated. They are far more Islamic than their grandparents ever were. Also, in the beginning, they, um, they had their own, their own culture apart from Islam, or Islam was only a small part of their identity. Uh, like, for instance, many Moroccans came to France and to Belgium and to Holland. And uh, many of them were Berber speaking, not even Arabic speaking. And they had little to do with Islam. Uh, they had their own cultural traditions. Now, in their own home country, those cultural traditions have gradually disappeared. In those days, they lived in the countryside, very isolated from the cities. Now they all have TV. They, they see what is happening in the cities and they try to imitate that. And so there is an enormous Islamification going on. This Berber culture is disappearing, although now they try to revive it, but objective uh, factors lead to its disappearance. And so uh, they don't have much of that culture anymore as a, as a factor of identity. They only have Islam left. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that very largely has to do with the policy of our own elites. Our, in my own country, ministers say, oh, you see, the solution for radicalization, you know, for, for terrorism, for, you know, youngsters who go to volunteer to fight in Syria and so on. The solution for that is more Islam, you know, and we should make it a Euro Islam as if, you know, in their, in their titanic hubris, you know, they really think that they can decide what Muslims are going to believe. That's ridiculous. Um, so, in the beginning it was just a mistake. They thought Islam was on its way out. That could have been, but that simply was not the case. Uh, now, more and more, the factor of mendaciousness is playing a role. Like you have the mendacious media, the Lügenpresse. Uh, whenever anything communally relevant is happening, they may report on it, though not even always. They may keep the lid on it as long as they can. 
like for instance about the uh, rapes during the New Year's night in, in Cologne 2015, they um, for four or five days they didn't uh, they didn't let out a word about it. You see, or they positively said that yes, it was a pleasant festival and nothing untoward happened. And it's only when on social media more and more news came out that they felt forced to to bring out news about it, mostly in the form of blaming the other media for having remained silent about it, as if they themselves had brought the truth about it. So there the, the, the term mendacious media was fully warranted. Or for example, uh, just now as we record this, a few days ago there has been uh, an attack on a tramway in Utrecht in Holland, killing three, I think, wounding a number, now, our media mentioned in all seriousness that this was a private affair, this was a family quarrel, whereas now we know that, first of all, there was no personal relation between the attacker and any of the victims. And uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, notes have been found in his possession where he explicitly invokes Islam as the reason for what he was doing. So you have this enormous mendaciousness of the media. It's everywhere, it's all the time. Um, or for example, uh, when in Paris, the massacre of Charlie Hebdo happened. Charlie Hebdo was a, a satirical weekly that had mocked Islam and the Prophet so some Muslims came in there and shot everyone. Now, why were they shot? Because they had criticized Islam. They were not shot because they were cartoonists or because they were journalists or so. Even in Arabia, you have cartoonists nowadays. You know, that was not the point. It is because they were Islam critics or as the phrase now goes, Islamophobic, you know. Uh, again, a mendacious term like, like you can't imagine, you know, pretending that criticism of religion, which according to Karl Marx is the start of any criticism, that criticism of religion is a mental disease. You know, that's what the term effectively implies. Now, you see, they were killed because they were critical of Islam. Now, after that, in studios, in press studios, they normally invite some comments from the group targeted. You know, I mean, if there is any, if there is, if there is a racial attack in America, they will call someone from, you know, the blacks or the Hispanics or whatever group has been targeted. And, um, you know, similarly over here, if there is a Hindu Muslim riot or what, they will normally, you know, give the floor to the group targeted. In the case of the murder of the Charlie Hebdo journalists, just the opposite happened. There was no studio, no newspaper that asked anything at all of any Islam critic. Just the opposite, it is the perpetrator group that was welcomed everywhere in studios to come and defend Islam, to come and say, mendaciously, this has nothing to do with Islam. So, you see that, that, that Muslims start to defend their own narrative, I can still understand. Uh, what is totally criminal is the behavior of our own elites and of our own media. So, you see there is a certain crisis, I understand. There is a problem with immigration, there is a problem with Islam. They themselves are part of the problem, but only a part, and maybe even a small part. You see, it all started with a civilizational crisis after the war. Christians will say it is because of the uh, de-Christianization of Europe. Now, I happen to be very much part of that movement of de-Christianization. 
I was a choir boy myself. I even seriously considered going for the priesthood as a child. Um, now, very soon, especially I think the turning point was around 1970, people left the churches in droves. And um, often that meant a relaxation of moral norms. Like, for instance, the church was against abortion. After this dechristianization got going, one country after another started legalizing abortion. Um, and so families started falling apart far more than they used to. Uh, this was also negative for demography. Uh, the um, birth control became general. Now, I guess in a place like India, where birth control has been such a national target uh, that everybody supports, uh, you will find it strange to see a lower birth rate as a problem. Well, in Europe, as well as in Japan, in Taiwan and so on, it is somewhat problematic in the sense that it leads to a decline in population rather than a stabilization of the population. Um, so Christians could say and do say, yes, you see, all this is happening because of dechristianization. Well, I think dechristianization was inevitable. You know, people can't keep on living with these fairly childish illusions. On the other hand, of course, Christianity is only one shape taken by a far more general human tendency to religiosity. And so Christianity had usurped a religiosity that existed before, that had taken many different forms, because paganism was not one religion, it was a, a whole religious landscape with all kinds of religious phenomena, some silly, some superstitious, some less so. Um, and so there were, there were developments in, in worldview that in fact would be relevant today. Like for instance, in Greece, you had the school of the Stoic philosophers who had a certain uh, view of life, of doing your duty, of uh, remaining unmoved in the face of suffering. And um, they started their day with something they called being in the now which means to concentrate on the here and now, is something like Zen Buddhism, is meditation. So you see, that would be a very good attitude to life. Unfortunately, what happened with dechristianization was, for most people, that they just fell into a void, where anything was possible, where anything was acceptable. I think Europe at that time, or even today, needs some form of dharma, some form of piety that is not centered on a superstitious belief, but that nonetheless maintains a certain seriousness to life, a certain feeling for norms, for values. Um, what pleads very much against the Christian case is the state of the churches today are the maybe the worst uh, egalitarians, you see, insisting on uh, treating everybody as equal and not exercising their, I mean, I think every human being should, of course, be treated as equal, but not every worldview. And so nowadays you find the Pope uh, washing the feet of Islamic asylum seekers, uh, praising Islam, uh, kissing the Quran and so on, and uh, you know, calling for uh, for solidarity with the Muslim community when, for example, in Christchurch, this attack took place, but not at all uh, calling for justice for the Christians in Egypt or anywhere in the Muslim world who are equally targets of. Uh, terrorist attacks and far, far, far more often than the Muslim community has ever been. Um, so there we have a complete sellout 
among the remaining Christians. So they are certainly not the solution. Return to Christianity, I think, is, uh, is, is useless to talk about. Um, but uh, a certain, a certain um, evolution to a, a certain kind of dharma, a certain kind of, uh, of piety, of, uh, uh, of seriousness, of religiosity, that makes sense, you see. And that would be a good thing for Europe. And so it has practical implications, like uh, a proper relation between what you can spend and what you do spend. I mean, that is like obvious, whatever religion you, uh, you espouse, obviously uh, you have to be realistic in uh, the means you acquire and the means you spend. So, you see, that is one thing that simply has to be done. Uh, we should care for other people, but not at the expense of our own people, uh, which is very much what is happening today. The elites don't have to suffer the consequences. You see, they live in gated communities and so on. It is the poor people who have to see their own uh, neighborhoods uh, being changed to something that they don't recognize themselves in anymore. It is they themselves who resent the present developments. And it is the selfishness, the carelessness of the elites that puts them through this. So, a provisional solution, I would say, is uh, one I will borrow from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Soviet dissenter. Is that we have to live in truth, or it's an expression that Indians themselves will very well understand. Satyam eva jayate. You see, that's a very good uh, slogan, not just for the state of India. It is just as valid for Europe or for anywhere else in the world. You see, if we just get realistic again and stop with these uh, silly moralistic dreams and utopias, and just return to normalcy, that is really enough. You see, we don't need any shrill, dramatic actions, certainly no, uh, no terrorist actions like happened in Christchurch. We don't need any dramatic uh, policy changes. We simply need to go back to normalcy, to realism, and that will mostly take care of the problem. Thank you.